<laughs> welcome, welcome. We are live. I see folks are streaming in. Hello, hello. Uh, welcome. We will be getting officially started in just a moment. I want to invite you all to take advantage of the chat. If you feel comfortable, please let us know how you're feeling, um, especially you mood meter users. We would love to get a sense of, of where you're at today. And I also want to remind you, we're going to have time for Q&A at the end of this session. And so I would invite you to go ahead and use, oh, thank you, James, for getting us started. Um, use the Q&A for any questions that you have that I can uh, bring to James, and we'll do our best to answer what we can. And thank you so much for joining us. So welcome. Um, I see, James, you're feeling joyful. I'm feeling excited. I'm feeling hopeful. I see we've got some motivation. That's great. So uh, my name's Camila Mize. I am the Director of Customer Success here at OG Life Lab, and I'm going to serve as your moderator for today's session. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this session on creating and cultivating a culture of inclusion. I have the privilege of introducing you all to our guest for this session, James Nicholas Kinney. Welcome, James. Hi, Camila. Hi. James Nicholas <laughs> Kinney is the Global Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer and North American Chief People Officer at Ogilvy which is one of the world's largest and most prestigious advertising and marketing brands. Right. He is an author. He's a speaker. He's been featured on Entrepreneur, CNN, NBC, Smart Money, and more. And he uses neuroscience, some emotional intelligence, performance psychology, and innovative behavior-based practices to help shift culture forward. James, I am thrilled to have the opportunity to be here with you today. Thanks for inviting me to be a part of this. And uh, to get us started, I would love if you could tell us more about what you really see as your mission as Global Chief of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Ogilvy. What's your mission, James? Camila, thank you so much for the opportunity. Just, you know, I'm going to add blessed to the chat because so blessed to have you as someone in my life that fully sees me, which, you know, propels me to do this work daily. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, and to everyone um, here at the conference. So shout out to the 56 of you and to those of you who will be joining. Um, so the question was, what is my mission, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been talking a lot uh, about psychological safety, meaning we mm -hmm. in the world and in workplaces. I think the interesting thing is that I'm mindful not to get into the branded words, right? Because branded words like Democrat, and then you get a drop down menu and Republican, you get a drop down menu or diversity, you get a drop down menu. And I find that oftentimes those drop down menus aren't inclusive mm -hmm. of, a, of a lived experience, right? Mm -hmm. So to land the plane on your question, my intention is to make sure that everyone's lived and or worked experience is one where they can really bring their full selves to the table right mm -hmm. which leaves room for bad days leaves room for headaches leaves room for child care leaves room to be latina or latino leaves room to be black leaves mm -hmm. room to be gay leaves room for all that right because i think when you can't bring your full self to the picture that we as an employer and as a culture are missing out on the full opportunity um so that's why you know i'm mindful not to be like oh psychologically safe boom stop no yeah. I want everyone to be able to bring that lived experience to the table. And that encompasses all that I said, plus more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what are, what are some ways that you can do that? I mean, given the platforms and the ways that we're working now, right. Which it feels like since the pandemic started, who we were at work, who we were at home kind of collapsed on themselves, right. Yeah. Once we're brought into um, these platforms that we're using, whether it's zoom or air Meet, so can you tell us a little bit more about some of the ways that you're bringing that mission to life at Ogilvy? Mm -hmm. So interesting thing is that I've been making this prediction and claiming where we are now for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like I remember writing years ago, like mid 2000s about this, that there is no, you know, you hear people say, oh, well, I check my personal life at the door when I go to work. No, you don't, because you got one brain and you got one life. So mm -hmm. the separation between work and life is not really a thing. Like how many people just show me in the chat, how many people here 
have work work dreams. I just want to see how many people say that they have work dreams. Everyone has work dreams. Yeah. Exactly. So it's so funny when you fill out your time sheet, you know, it's like, how long, how, how many hours have you been working? I've been working 24 hours a day because work is life and life is work. Mm -hmm. So going back to the bio that you read about me, which I really appreciate. In 2015, I, um, I took a neuroscience course at um, UCLA. And I used it as kind of a, a way for me to understand the brain and behavior more. And I learned things like neuropsychology and I learned things about neuroplasticity, which I was super curious about. Mm -hmm. I went to an emotional intelligence academy also in 2015. And then I went to Stanford to study culture in 2017. Mm -hmm. But what I learned through all those things is that traditional HR and shout out to my HR community worldwide. But traditional HR is reactive, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that I have an employee assistance program. I have terminations. I have hiring. I have annual open enrollment. That's the basic 1.0. If you were to train someone on like, okay, what is HR? But what the, front, the, the next frontier has been and what I've been doing with organizations that I've served is really using that neuropsychology to program a population. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a whole different way to think. So the very simple way to say it is that if I give better inputs to the culture, then I'm, then I know the outputs will be different, and that's because of mirror neurons. Right, mm -hmm. if I see people that look like me, if I see things that are different than me, it allows for cognition and recognition that there is something different. Right. So if you see a CEO that's rapping on a zoom or that surfing on the weekends or you know what whatever thing that is big oh i thought a ceo was supposed to act like this hmm. i thought a, a chief people officer was supposed to act like that so one of the programs in particular that i'm that i've done that i honestly think is one of my favorites the way that i would describe it is um, a integrated kind of a compounding program and what I mean by that is it's called 100% You. And we actually just had it this morning. We have the second installment. And my thinking behind 100% You was, how do we let people bring 100% of you to work, to mm -hmm. the table? But we have to show them and model dynamic behaviors. So I've hired eight women uh, so far intentionally. Mm -hmm to shift power dynamics in the workplace. There's a lot behind the thinking that I don't ever say in public that I'll say here today. Mm -hmm. But I hired eight women on purpose. The first four women that I've hired were three women of, of, of color and even diverse based off of what the definition of women uh, of, of color is. Mm -hmm. We taught people meditation and mindfulness. We taught people how to cook, which goes into tactile sensory and rewiring the brain and disconnecting from computers, building community so, so, so much more. We taught people how to move their, their bodies in a very, very simple way. Um, hired, um, hired a dark skinned woman uh, for that. Again, not stuff that I would say out in publicly, but I was strategic in the casting, right? Mm -hmm. But hired four different women experts, really built a halo around them as the experts of, again, modeling behavior, which is kind of where like the geeking comes in. Yeah. The, the second cohort of women that I just hired, we're teaching people music production, horticulture, how to code, build, build websites and um, apps, um, and how to paint. And again, think about just the, what, what, what we're doing right now, think about those four inputs. And if I'm a copywriter or a creative or a strategist or someone in finance, my inputs that I'm getting in the workplace and the behaviors that I'm seeing and the types of people that I'm seeing are completely different. And those inputs lead to those outputs. So I, I hope that wasn't too long. But no, that's Yeah, but there's a whole list of things that I knew that I was programming in with yeah. this type of casting and programming. Well, what I hear in that and appreciate is um, just how 
like multi-dimensional, right? We're talking about cooking. We're talking about music. We're talking, it's beyond the bounds of um, what we would consider traditionally, you know, professionally focused, right? We are really thinking about the whole person, um, which makes sense, right? For 100% you. That's it. And it ties in nicely with this next question around, you know, why emotional intelligence is relevant to DEI work. And um, if you could tell us a little bit more about your thoughts about the intersection of emotions and inclusion, would love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, so emotions and inclusion are super closely linked because we know going back to the lived experience that we talked about earlier, we know that people's lived experience is not the same. Mm -hmm. And a individual's ability to process their emotions, aka through emotional intelligence, is one of the key ways that we can retain talent and we can develop talent. So when we look at diversity as an employment strategy, now keep in mind, diversity is a huge conversation. There's, mm -hmm. bio, there's biodiversity in nature. Mm -hmm. like we can talk about that. Like We can build crops. We can build cities that are diverse too. But if we're talking about diversity in the workplace, what we have to recognize is that, and I think we're going to talk about this in a little bit, beyond a alleged tick box of our numbers look good, yeah. retaining and developing talent in all forms is really the ultimate metric, mm -hmm. right? Because if you have talent that you brought in your building from Nicaragua, from Kenya, but they leave six months later, mm -hmm. their ideas have never been implemented, their communications aren't seen or heard, then literally it's a trophy uh, versus yeah. contributors to business and cultural intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. so that's why that link is so key because the EQ of the organization based off of the EI of every person in it is the conduit for anyone that's diverse in a population to be able to be seen and heard going back to psychological safety. So if I'm a quadriplegic and I'm in the workplace and the only place that I'm represented is the person that works in the mailroom, mm -hmm. we're having a conversation on uh, differences in ability. My voice may not be a part of that conversation because I'm not at the director or the VP level. So that's where you get into the representation. And to me, the, the funnel, if you will, of how this inclusion occurs is through EI. Mm -hmm. The communications can occur because there's the courage that EI provides. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I think a lot about the... Um... We'll talk here at OG about the neutral vocabulary that you can learn when you start learning how to express or talk about emotions or ask people about theirs in that shared language. And so um, I'm curious about, you know, we're thinking about, you mentioned EQ at the organizational level and then dropping into that micro level of emotional intelligence um, as it, you know, has to do with teams, let's say. Um, you've got teams and you want to create an inclusive environment. What are your thoughts about at that level, whether it's teams or managers, you know, in their one-on-ones and how EI can show up in those interactions? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I always tell people better questions get better answers. Mm -hmm. And I've also been quoted to say, and I, and I, I love this, like this gets me so amped um, when I was, when I was writing, but I, I wrote this on LinkedIn. I, I think I need to do a rant on LinkedIn again, because it's been a while, <laughs> but I said, um, the quality of your question indicates the level of your care. Woo! Woo, let's go. Let's go. I'm going to say it one more time. Yes. The quality of your question indicates the level of your care. I mean, to me, that just like, boom. Yeah. So, if, so if you're a manager, right, or a leader, and you're like, and you never say like, yo, like, how's that 5K going? Like, what's up with your kid? Like, what's your dog's name? Um right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, there's no empathy. There's no compassion because it's just all about the work. And we know through the neuroscience of trust, if I know something about you, Camila, and I take the time to ask, but here's the thing, I take the time to remember and I follow up, yo, how's your boyfriend? How's your dog? How's your mm -hmm. cat? Like, what's up with your mom? Is she good now? Like, I know she was sick. 
that shit right there, that's everything. That's yeah. that's relationships. Yeah. Well, and that ties in so beautifully with in our opening keynote with um, Niobe Way, we're talking about this crisis of connection, right? And a theme that came up in that was the power of listening and, and being able to really see and hear one another. And so that's such a great illustration of how we can do that more actively. And I think I saw a question that came through here yeah. in the chat. Um, let's see, from Heather around... You know, when leaders or those with more privilege show 100% of themselves, it can have a different effect than someone who's more marginalized or in the mailroom, as you mentioned, James. So how can we make it safe for everyone to be 100% of themselves? What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, I, I think that goes back to asking the question, ask, a, asking the right question. Mm -hmm. So uh, to your point, Heather, I believe it is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Heather. Um, at scale, this is a challenge. Right. Because um, performance management at scale is typically seen as a financial and or a punitive conversation. So you have to really reframe how performance management works and the way that we're engineering this ship to be better. Of those kind of conversations is that we have inclusion scores. So we have inclusion scores and we have net promoter scores, which are high level but they give us an indicator of how we are doing on uh, the person's individual experience from the executive leadership level, the leadership level, and then at the manager level. Um, but to your point, Heather, I think the better we get at it, which we're not perfect, mm -hmm. the better we get at it. I'm a really big believer that the management layer is where we make all the difference. So I built a program with Calm actually called uh, Mindful Manager. And it's the world's first um, program um, that, that I built. And I took 840 managers and we do morning meditations for the first, my, my organization started in 1948. This is the first time in history that it's, that it's happened. And the reason why I did that is because I believed, again, going back to the, the neuroscience training, is that if I could influence the behavior of 840 managers to be more mindful and not like snapping at people and, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. then that would then influence the organization as a whole. So I hope that answers your question, Heather. Thank you, James. And that ties in nicely with what I was hoping we could explore next, which is what advice do you have for folks that are trying to get this work started within their organizations, you know, or for people who are having trouble getting support or buy-in from those people in positions of power? Yeah, so it does need to go back to a uh, quantitative business case. Um, there's a lot of different types of CEOs and CFOs. What I've noticed is that um, there's a couple of different cells, if you will, if this is a sales thing. Mm -hmm. um, from a talent attraction standpoint and a brand value standpoint, no matter where you work, everyone is interested in being able to hire rad people. These days, it might be hard for you to, rad, to hire rad people or retain rad people if you're not leaning into this kind of work. So my pitch is, we need innovative programming, inclusive innovative programming that you, Mr. or Mrs. or they, them, CEO, CFO, um, can get return on investment. And I love to use fear as well uh, in a good way. And the fear sell is, hey, if we don't do this, our competitors likely are, and mm -hmm. it'll be hard for us to compete in the next three years. And I don't know an organization where that's not true, actually. You know, yeah. you look at like Sherm or different publications, Gallup polls. I mean, there's so much data out there to prove that this isn't some sort of like myth or like hocus pocus. It's not fake news. It's really real that candidates, regardless if you're Gen Z, millennial, Gen X or boomer, no one wants to work with jerks. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that, that's like a simple value prop. But I would add some quantitative evidence behind it. So here's the thing. If your attrition is below 10%, you're doing good. But most people in 2021 experience attrition at 20% up or, or, or north mm -hmm. of that. So now is a really good time to sell your CEOs, your CFOs, or for those of you that are CEOs and CFOs on the call, you need to keep your attrition below 10% because attrition costs you a lot of money. A $50,000 person, it costs 10% of that salary to backfill that role. 
hundred um hundred thousand dollar person costs twenty percent north of 150 three hundred thousand dollar person it might take you six months to fill that role and it costs you a significant amount of capital mm-hmm. so you might as well be on your a game when it comes to retention and these programs are not expensive like using og life lab you know using using calm uh developing your own bespoke programs they're not expensive and i'll give you one more metric before we continue a healthy organization sh- should spend anywhere from a thousand to $1,200 per year per employee on investing in them. You do that however it makes sense for you. You can get box lunches, you can do, you know, you need Netflix subscriptions, whatever you want, but you need to spend between $1,000 and $1,200 per year per employee to create that experience. Got it. That's super helpful and concrete, James, which I know uh, folks that are joining us today really appreciate. And it ties in nicely with what my next question was going to be around what's the cost of not prioritizing this work? I think we just touched upon yeah. you know, quite a bit of that. But if there's any other thoughts that you would share about the cost of not um, you know, prioritizing this, what does that mean beyond talent retention and attraction? Yeah. So I'm going to give you one more term that I, um, that I also geek out on that I, uh, that, that I wrote in, um, in one of my rants. Um, and it's called ghost money, um, as in Halloween ghost. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I, I got, I got new Invisalign braces. So I'm like learning how to talk. I'm (laughs) I'm about to start mine, James. Really? Yeah. I'm, I'm between the uniform and the Invisalign. (laughs) See, I'm a hundred percent of myself. I'm 44 year old nerd with braces. There we go. Um, so, um, ghost money is a real thing. And let me tell you what ghost money is. Every organization has a monthly P&L, quarterly P&L, annual P&L. That's the system that was invented for us to track financial performance. Every organization also has a balance sheet. Balance sheet is where there's debt and where investors spend some of their time. Or if you're, you know, publicly traded, um, X, Y, and Z. Balance sheet is where your cash reserves are, right? However, ghost money is money that you can't see. And which is why I created that term. So what ghost money means is Bob, Susie, and Sally leave the organization. The role is open for two or three months. Who do you think has been doing all that work since Bob, Susie, and Sally left? Well, Joe, Bob, James, and Camila have been doing that work. Mm -hmm. So the strain that it caused on us and the productivity slowdown, there's not a, there's not a, um, um, ERP, um, um, there's not an ERP tool, whether it's Oracle or these big fancy accounting systems, there's nothing in the world that's been created yet to measure the productivity of every single person in your organization. So peep this, when I was consulting, I came up with something called the OOR, which is, which means organizational optimization rate. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you have a thousand people just as a baseline and you said, Hey, all 1,000 of those people are going hard in the paint for eight hours a day, which is impossible. It, it will never happen on the planet Earth. But if it did, you would be at 100% organizational optimization rate because the organization is optimized. No one ever gets sick. Everyone's always on time. Again, it's not possible. But imagine an organization where people are leaving left and right, shit's toxic, hate their manager, there's no emotional intelligence involved, it's a revolving door. You can imagine and predict that your organizational optimization rate might be in the 60th percentile. So the organizational optimization rate, if you measure that by efficiency, by attrition, by P&L, and by all of those holistic factors, you can kind of follow me down this journey and say, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe we should measure ourselves by effectiveness, not vanity metrics. Mm -hmm. P&Ls can be vanity metrics. We're super profitable, but guess what? Everyone thinks you're a piece of shit. So if everyone thinks you're- Talk to that, yeah. (laughs) Right, (laughs) then congrats for being profitable. (laughs) But your employees hate you Mm -hmm. and the public thinks you suck. Mm Right. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking of any yeah. company in particular, but but I'm saying this is this is another level of thinking. 
it's pretty much like ESG thinking, right? Like yeah. in, in environmental, social, and governance thinking about corporate citizenship, right? Anyway. Got it. Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. uh, and this jumps into you know, something we talked about at the beginning of this, which is really what it takes to go beyond box checking, right? So in the past like 18 months, past two years, there's been an increase in town hall meetings, conversations that have been happening that are long overdue. Um, but there's a lot of organizations that often get stuck at thinking um, that awareness is the win and um, really not taking that next step to go beyond box checking, to take that awareness into practice. So um, what are some ways that we can go beyond, you know, just the town hall? What do we do next as organizations uh, focusing on prioritizing DEI? Yeah, uh, of course. Can I answer the Q&A real quick? And then yeah, I'll of course. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Lori, hi, how are you? Really nice to meet you. Um, so um, the Mindful Manager uh, program was not optional. Uh, because that was an opportunity for me to do a hard line to make sure that this program was a, a priority. So I, I set out to have a thousand people. I bought a thousand seats, 850 signed up, attended. It's only a four week program because I knew that I could only ask for so much, but attendance has been in the, in, in, in the 80th percentile, which is really good, you know, considering how hard it is to get all the cats in um, a box. Um, I can also give you an intro to the people at, at Calm who I built the program with. Um, uh, the folks at, at OG have all my contact info. So nice to, 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 to meet you. Um, hope that answers your question. And then um, when leaders or even those more privileged show 100% of themselves. Yeah. I think that was the question we had from Heather earlier. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. And then yeah. are we teaching them all of those skills as part of their positions, whole person development? Um, you know what? I, I I haven't figured that part out yet, but I think that's where creating the space for inclusion allows them to bring their whole selves. But I would love a world where you could kind of uh, incorporate whole training, which would probably be like academic, spiritual, uh, you know, health and wellness. You could bring all the all 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 those things to the the table. But I personally haven't figured that one out. Anyway. Um, Camila, so to go back to answering your question about how to go beyond the checkbox and the, the tick box and the, the action. Yeah. Part. So I, there, there's a couple, uh, there's two concrete things I'm going to give you. One, um, whatever your diversity success story is, it has to be your own. Um, it can't be OG Live Labs. It can't be Ogilvy's. Um, it can't be the University of Michigan's. Every time that I speak and I educate other organizations, again, I'd be mindful of the branded words because the brand, the branded words, COVID is a branded word. And let's and, and let's and let's be honest where that's gotten us. It's a mm -hmm. shit, show, like whether you're on one side or the other. COVID's a complete hot mess. Mm -hmm. So whatever diversity is for you as an organization, define that first. Because you can have an organization with all men and you need to have gender diversity. You can have an organization with all women and you need men as diversity. If you're in Minneapolis, it's different than Atlanta, Georgia. If you're in San Diego, it's different than Seattle, Washington. So you should also, you should factor in all that and decide what success looks like for you based off your journey. I would make your journey a five-year process. So just to be quantitative, don't say by next year, we're going to have X amount of this or, or that. Make it a five-year journey. That's 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 number one. Number two, open up your aperture. Now that we're able to hire um, international and across all 50 states, if you have an organization where you have knowledge workers, um, I would recommend that you form entities in all 50 states or at least run payroll and be able to hire people from all 50 states because you're going to be able to get the representation you seek a lot faster and you're gonna have a lot of cognitive diversity with being able to hire from all 50 states. Um, that's number two. Um, number three, um, make sure that you do everything that you say you're gonna do. And what I mean by that is I've developed what I call a 4E framework. So I was on with a bank this morning and we're helping them with their ESG strategy because uh, I, I do a lot of client work too. And here's something that you all should write down. Um, the four E's are earn, 
enter, engage, and enhance. So here's the thing. If company XYZ is making commitments that they can't keep, the real is going to come out because they're going to fail with their diversity commitments. And I don't think that's something that people want to do. But if you earn the right to enter the space through developing a relationship with the communities that make sense for you, which again, could be LGBTQIA, could be Black, could be South Asian, could be East Asian, completely up to you on what that success looks like. So again, don't fall for the, I must do X for X. We are going to, like, I, I went to dinner with a, HR colleague of mine, and uh, just to tell you a quick story, mm -hmm. and um, they said, well, I'm mandating that we have a certain amount of BIPOC professionals in the executive team by X date. And I was like, okay. You know, and, and she was, sorry, I, I slipped instead of they, she, um, um, was kind of like looking for my approval. And I was like, I'm just listening to you. And after they told me what they wanted to do for like 15, 20 minutes. I just turned around and said, cool, you might get all that you want, but make sure that it is not in exchange for the culture. Meaning if you disrupt the culture and destroy the culture on behalf of a metric that you mm -hmm. want to achieve, you got to think about that holistically with the business. If you're changing out people every five seconds, you know, firing people, you're going to get sued too. Right. So there's, there's, there's that part, but, be mindful about quotas because the person who fulfills your quota, how do you think they feel? Oof, that ties in so beautifully with speaking about, you know, being out to dinner again, which is so exciting to finally be out and about in the world safely when we can. Um, I had a peer who, when I was preparing for this session with you, asked a question around this very topic, which is, you know, what do I do if I feel like I was hired not for my talents, but to meet and fill a diversity need? You know, how do I push back against that imposter syndrome when I'm stepping into a space where I still feel like an outsider? So what are your thoughts on that? It's a big one. <laughs> and I would love, you know, the chat as well. I would just please feel free to engage. I know. I saw this question. I was like, oh, Lord. Yeah, uh, we're going to go there. <laughs> I mean, look, I, the only thing I can do is just really talk about my own experience. Mm -hmm. People ask me all the time, like, how, how did you get to where you've gotten and I was just answer really simply. I was just determined to not be out out read. Like when I tell y'all the stories about me going to to Stanford real quick or UCLA real quick. I mean that was nights and weekends work um, while I was hustling trying to pay pay rent. You know what I mean? So I think for your friend and for anyone else on the call, regardless of how you identify, and keep in mind. Men are a part of the diversity solution. White men are a part of the diversity solution. Straight white men are a part of the diversity solution. So no matter how you identify on this call, um, I think not being outread and fully being comfortable to bring your whole self to the table, I think is the key to overcome. Maybe they were hired as a intended token but then they get into the environment and they are amazing. And people see that, oh, actually it's just one of the smartest people that we ever hired. And then, you know, I think sometimes that's what leadership is. If you were Rosa Parks and you were like, no, nah, fuck that, I'm keeping my seat on the bus, mm -hmm. that's leadership and that took a lot of courage. And sometimes you have to step out on that and be the example so that you educate others through behavior. Because remember, talking points are just talking points. Yeah. But behavior is what is contagious. That is emotional contagion, bringing it mm -hmm. full circle, right? Yeah. So, I, so I think it's about making sure that you um, come to the table as a professional. But here's the thing, where I think meditation and mindfulness comes in, which is why I'm fully dedicated to teaching meditation and mindfulness to um, BIPOC professionals and LGBTQ professionals, is that you don't, you don't have to have the imposter syndrome you know, putting your hand on your heart and your hand on your belly and breathing deep and being mindful and, you know, releasing the anxiety, you can bring your whole self in those environments. Because I do see one of the biggest problems that we're having now is because everything has exploded so much, attrition within um, Black and other populations is high 
because sometimes they enter into the environment and don't immediately feel a connection. Mm -hmm. But it's important that the individual has control over themselves and how they see the world. Right now, this doesn't have anything to do with like actual racism or actual systematic issues, which we know are very, very real. But I'm just talking about the individual's ability to have self self control and self governance, which is where the emotional intelligence piece comes in. Yeah, and I'm I'm thinking about a comment Mark made during the opening keynote about how you know throughout the past 18 months, it's like my own self rating of my own EQ, even though I'm completely immersed in this work, <laughs> continues to drop as I realize just how much um, there is to really put into practice, right? To go beyond awareness and into practice. And I'm thinking, you know, specifically just to be transparent and open in the spirit of, you know, we're all always learning. Something I'm currently working on is taking full responsibility for my emotion experience, right? And so when you're talking about having that, that sense of agency, that sense of self-awareness, um, of course, our environments are going to impact us. We're going to get different stimuli and inputs that are going to change our, our feelings in a given moment. But taking that power back and that sense of responsibility over how I can meet this moment um, is, is a very different position to be in than um, waiting for others to, to give you permission um, to feel you know, safe, regulated. Yeah, yeah. I actually really needed to hear that, like what, like what you just said. Yeah. Um, Jill, I think that is. Yeah. Um, what I mean by not being outread is that all knowledge in the universe is um, abundant and readily available on Google or in a library. So when I so when I say not being outread, uh, I'm saying like I I I I don't need to be the smartest person in the room, but I don't want to be outread. Uh, meaning that how do you combat imposter syndrome? It's knowing your stuff. So that's what I mean. Got it. Thank you, James. So um, as we go on here, and I just want to make sure we're not missing any additional chats or questions. Yeah, we got Luz. Let's see. Hi, Luz. Let's see. Looks like that was answered. The money cost of uh, losing people. Yeah. The ghost money. Basically, it's not trackable or traceable, but it's there. Turnover costs money. And there's millions of surveys that to prove it. But that's the simplest way to say it. But ghost money is a term you can use that does not appear on the P&L or the balance sheet, but it's there. Got it. Thank you. And, yeah. And then Mindful Manager is not on the Calm app. It's a it's a bespoke program that was custom created. But you can contact me and I can and I can show you how we did it. Great. Thank you. So another question we've got here is that sometimes we unintentionally suffer from blind spots, right? Whether as individuals or teams, departments, entire organizations. Um, some people are more open to having those blind spots pointed out, right? In the effort of, of learning and growing, but not everybody feels that way. So how do you identify those blind spots within an organization when you're coming in, you're starting to do this work? Mm, yeah, I mean, that's so true. Like sometimes I don't even trust myself because I'm like, you're in your cycle again. You're you've you've done this story before. Um, I really think that's where feedback loops come in on a regular basis and just providing space. So I'll give you a few mechanisms that I've done to create that. And this is kind of interesting. You you definitely got to be on your OG Life Lab game to, to do this. But I have office hours every Friday. And anyone and every and anyone and everyone can pop on my my Zoom, and we literally just bullshit and just talk. And what you do there, you get a feeling of how people are doing. You know what I mean? Because stuff comes out, people slip, people are detached, and that gives me the ability to kind of assess people and see where they really are from a headspace um, perspective. So that's one thing that I do that creates a a non formal feedback loop. The other thing that I do is I have a morning daily, daily stand up. And again, a lot of my leaders pop on. I have 16 director and up level reports of people that report to me. And I have a staff of about 70 people. So my job is to serve and protect them. You know what I mean? So that daily stand up, again, is another informal feedback loop. Um, because what I find from human beings, including myself, 
if you go too long without having conversations or engaging or allow for emotional processing, people make up stories in their head. And you know what I mean? And they, they typically don't give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, so I've created those autonomic feedback loops, if you will, in order to hold that space. And it's time worth invested all the time. I've worked with so many different leaders where like, if I never see them, I mean, I'm 44 years old, but I'm still a human being. Like I get in my feelings too. Oh, I've never heard from my, my boss never checks on me. I mean, everyone gets in their feelings about it. Mm -hmm. did, 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 did that answer the question? Yeah, and I think I'm I'm hearing this theme. And before we we, I just want to acknowledge this great comment from Luz um, about someone from disability awareness saying, uh, "Don't say blind spots because," it, but it says blank spots because they were discriminatory against blind mm -hmm. people. So that's another example of thank you for calling that out. Right, that's another way we can start to build our awareness um, is by being in an environment where we can be a bit more conscious about the language that we are using and how that's going to land, right? When sometimes the intent is different than the stated impact. And mm -hmm. coming back, James, to what you were talking about, yeah. I'm noticing this common thread around active listening and creating open channels for communication on an ongoing basis, right? That's not something that's just going to happen, whether it's at the town hall or in a monthly meeting, but finding ways to bake that into the way that you're working. Um, yeah. One of the things that I've learned from OG Life Lab that I love so much about the technology, the platform and the skills that you all provide is that people make emotional intelligence kind of this big thing like, oh, my God, like, how do I do that? Or how do I? But it's like, you know, from what I learned from you, you know, it's the simplest definition that I know. Right. It's like the ability for a person to manage and regulate their emotions. Right. So creating the mechanism for that to happen again in a loose way i think opens up the authenticity because it's so funny we have this b2b work from um a client that we're doing right now and um part of my diversity job is to re review a lot of work before it goes out the door you know commercials campaigns and all that and um it, it, it's, it's a comedy campaign that makes a mockery of the boss who like tries too hard to be inclusive. And like one of the skits is this person has this hot dog machine and they're just like super psyched. Hey, everybody, we got a hot dog machine. And they were just like so cheesy. And everyone was like, wah, wah, we don't care about your hot dog machine. And then there's there's like the rah, rah, rah leader that has like pom poms and like literally is like, trying to do chants and cheers everybody and people are like wah, wah. so i think the forced part of it can come across inauthentic but just creating those channels for people mm -hmm. to feel is a really good way to do it yeah thank you james i was imagining you were going to say that there was a giant hot dog that was sitting there <laughs> like, oh a hot dog that is cheering yes cheering in the hot dog yeah. <laughs> And then singing a bad remake of Bon Jovi and pour sh sugar on me. He said, pour some mustard on me. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> pour some mustard on me. And we didn't talk about that version of Lionel at the beginning of this. We, we so did not. We're really tying it all together. <laughs> all right. So um, we've got some other comments in here from our friend Tasha, intent versus impact. So she shared that a personal way to shift was to change the way she shows up in spaces to lead with impact, thinking about how her message is going to impact those in that space. Um, thank you so much, Tasha. James, any thoughts on that? Tasha, you're spot on. Thanks for doing the good, good work in the world. If there was more people like you, we would be good. Car washes, banks, Starbucks. We need Tasha's everywhere. <laughs> here, here. And a question from Errol. So how do we really help employees to recognize the cycle of bitterness or combativeness, you know, the types of cycles that lead to divisiveness, distractions, and unproductivity? Um, because they find that people become possessive about space and knowledge in the office. So that's a juicy one. That's a brilliant assessment, first of all. I, congrats. I, I haven't heard anyone like break that down as succinctly. So what I do is I run... 360s on people and 360s are a great way to get peer feedback 
360 doesn't always mean that the person will be terminated, you know, speaking out of the HR side of, of my job. But 360s are a powerful way to say, listen, this is how others are experiencing you. And then a big emotional intelligent thing that happens every single time. When you give a person the feedback, do they attack you? Because then it verifies the behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Or do they go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't know I was you know, being received that way. Um, cool. We're, what are a couple steps that I can do to improve, you know, my, my colleagues' experiences with interacting with me? That's really what you want to see because that is emotionally intelligent. So the mechanism that I do for that is to use 360s, but not always in a performance improvement plan way or in a punitive way, just to get accurate feedback and knowledge. Got it. Thank you, James. I really appreciate and I hope folks here are also appreciating just how practical, you know, taking this work into action can be. And so thanks for giving us some frameworks to do that. Mm -hmm. um, here, here, Jill, 360s are definitely a gift. <laughs> so James, you've been really open about your own journey with anxiety and depression, a near fatal car accident as a teen, having to learn mm -hmm. how to walk again. Um, sometimes these wounds that we carry are invisible to others. And so what are some ways that we can actively create that safe environment for people to feel like they can bring the, their full selves to work? Well, I'm still working on mine because to your point, they're invisible. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure I'll spend the rest of my life recovering from my trauma and compounding traumas one way or another. And a friend of mine broke this down in a real cool way, like big T's, medium T's and little T's. And I would say like my car accident, like the death of my dad and like my fiance leaving me five months before the wedding, those are probably like big T's. And then like a medium T's, like the death of my grandmother, like she was 95, she was a legend. Like I was like, hey girl, you did your thing, 95, like, you know what I'm saying? It still hurts that my grandma died, but like she's a legend and like I understand that. And then like a little T is like you're dating someone and you get ghosted, right? Or you lose the championship in your high school basketball game. So I think those are like kind of healthy and funny to talk through, like the big T's, the middle T's, and the 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 little T's. But in terms of how you can do it at work, I really think well, number one, I didn't ask permission, so that's just me. Um, I'm aware that I'm in a position of privilege because I am global C-suite and all that, but I'm not going to say people encourage me to do it. It was just something that I think is important to do mm -hmm. so that I can create space and hold space for others. But as an employer, again, there are mechanisms for you to do that. And in the interview process, for example, I don't do a ton of interviewing these days, but when I do... I often ask people questions like, you know, what is the greatest thing that you've ever achieved? And then sometimes that allows people, again, the quality of your question indicates the level of your care. So mm -hmm. I think asking your team those questions like that, what is the greatest thing that you've ever overcome? It allows for those kind of questions. Then the second thing I would say as a diversity chief, again, speaking out of that side of my job, um, I hold a lot of safe rooms. And it is totally not a work environment. Um, when AAPI hate <clears throat> was prominent, mm -hmm. still going on, just for the record. But I held the first ever Black and Asian safe room. And it was super dope because, you know, I, 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 I put it through the lens of the last hundred years. And it was sad, but fascinating to see hatred towards the Asian community in America and hatred towards the black community in America and how their journeys are similar. And we created bonding through that experience. Mm -hmm. So I think if you hold regular safe rooms with your people, they will spill the tea and talk about it all. But you got to set the ground rules from the jump. I'm not here as your boss. I'm not here as HR. I'm not here as your CMO. I'm here as the homie, AKA a friend. Um, and when you do that, people will open up and then you then you in, you increase that neuroscience of trust because they can say you know what camila like she's a real one like she she wasn't being corporate she wasn't being fake and the world that i see now across 
all companies, people that put a mask on to go to work, every other coworker calls them out on it. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't like it anymore. Yeah. Well, and we're quick to pick up on that. I imagine that's something you see too um, when you're reviewing campaigns, right? Is people sniff that out. If you see some exchange that's happening on social media and it doesn't seem like that's not a real thing that someone would say, you know, people are, are very um, quick to be able to identify that authenticity. Yeah. That and they'll, yeah. And they'll, and, and they'll call you out like this is super fake. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, I just want to appreciate and echo what folks are sharing here in the chat, which is thanking you, James, for your transparency mm -hmm. and your authenticity um, and, and being willing to share with us. Because I think that <clears throat> really gives people permission to acknowledge, right, those, whether it's the invisible wounds or the things that we carry into these spaces is to see somebody who's in a position of power, a position of influence um, saying, hey, I'm fully human <laughs> as well. And so just want to thank you so much for that. Um, I know we're coming up at the end of the hour here. <laughs> We've got folks who want to know how they can hop on your Friday calls too. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> your fan base grows, James. <laughs> uh, well, well, listen, um, you can all go to my website. I, I'll, I'll type it in here. And um, I have free weekly affirmations and meditations that and they're I'm beautiful. Out. Take it from someone who I have appreciated those so much, James. I've shared them with my team too. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So on, on Spotify and Apple Music, you can get my weekly affirmations there and my podcast. So just follow follow me. Uh, or you can also follow me on Instagram. I'll put that here. And, um, you know, I'm pretty active and I, I take active requests for prayer and for meditations and for different things, it's non-denominational, so all are welcome. Making sure my name is correct, but that's my Instagram as well. But you can follow me on Instagram. Go to my website, and um, I have so much just free content that's um, available for anyone. I really make sure that I lean in and invest into people, communities across the world, um, and I do as much as I can. Oh, thank you so much, Tasha. Um, and thank you, Art, from Corn Fairy. Corn Fairy is legendary in this work, Art. So thanks for the work that y'all do in the world as well. But yeah, I'm kind of a corporate hippie. So um, <laughs> follow the-, the Don't let the callers fool you. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't let it fool you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm just wondering, you know, one last question, James, is as we're thinking about the future, right? And where we would be at, you know, a year from now at EI 2022, um, this year's theme, we're embracing change. Um, we've had the opportunity to talk about taking awareness into action, the power of active listening. As we're thinking about the future, what are some you know trends or topics or conversations that you think we might be having uh, a year from now? What's kind of on, on the edge of the horizon there for you? Mm, yeah, well, before I answer that, um, yeah. just so the audience knows, because I'm, I'm happy that y'all are excited about this work. Um, Actually, OG Life Lab and I, uh, I have the intention of being more of a regular friend, let's say, with, with OG Life Lab. Um, so I am excited about that. Uh, let's just say that was a very cryptic message, but um, let's just say that I want to <laughs> bring my whole self to OG Life Lab. Let's just say, say that. Um, but what I would say is um, what we're going to see in the future. I really, Heather's like very interesting. And oh my gosh, we got some love from Mark Brackett. Thanks oh, for Oh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Um, so um, I think where the future is heading is the following. When we talk about return to office or we talk about hybrid work, I really think, and here's how I'm going to explain it. Um, in one of the diversity sessions I was in with a large pharmaceutical company, we talked about a world where the retail environment is completely different. Mm -hmm. And hear me out because this is very real and you can see the signs that almost like as a futurist that this is occurring. We used to go to McDonald's and there was seven people working behind the register. Now there's a kiosk and the kiosk is AI driven machine learning and it's data driven. We used to go to Chase Bank and there were tellers everywhere. There was eight people and that was one person that works at Chase Bank. And that machine 
is giving data to the back end of Chase Bank. We used to go to CBS. The story goes on and on and on how we're seeing this change. Employers who don't see that trend are really going to start to lose people fast. Mm -hmm. And I think we're heading towards a massive cliff of FTEs, right? Of full-time employees. And it's because as the Airbnbs of the world, travel, transportation, technology enables people to create enough money to put food on the table. Why would you work at a huge corporation if that experience, okay, mm -hmm. think about this from an experience perspective. If the experience of working at a corporation, 100 employers or more, let's just say the Affordable Care Act th threshold, if you're not creating that experience for your people, and if you're not a teaching hospital as an employer of 100 or more, I think people are going to just drop off the cliff. COVID has exacerbated that. So my tip to any employer, including what I'm trying to do with my own, is that you have to become a teaching hospital. You have to use OG Life Lab. You have to teach people things. You have to grow people. You have to pay them. It has to be an experience. One of the first things I said when I took this gig is I said, why? And my why was this. How do we wake up every morning to Peloton, Instagram, and Postmates, but work is like it's 1994? Why? <laughs> yeah. I mean, wh why? Mm -hmm. you, you go to work and you're using PowerPoint slides from 2003. But on my phone, I can do anything in the whole world in minutes. Mm-hmm. So employers need to see that trend. And I think it's a um, amalgamation cocktail of, for lack of a better terms, as my Gen Z friends would say, you got to create a vibe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you really do. You have to create a vibe. You have to teach people how to meditate at work as part of the job. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the MBA is now offered from the job. Yep. That's the future. Oh, I want to have a whole other session. We could have an entire conference around that topic, James. It's something I get really excited thinking about and just why it's so important that uh, we value, you know, the being fully human and supporting people in their humanness. And so even the programs that you're already implementing are starting to move in that direction. Um, super fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. Thanks Thank you to that. everybody who joined us today for your Thanks thoughtful everyone. questions, your chats. Um, we're going to have a break after this session. Um, there's going to be a 15 minute break after this next session. So once we close this out, you'll be brought back into the main area. We invite you to take a break stretch, breathe, get some water, maybe take some notes or think about some of the big takeaways from today's session or the sessions that you've joined. And we look forward to welcoming you later today. Thank you so much. And thank Thanks, you, everyone. James. Camila, Great for you, thank always. you, my friend, always. <laughs> All right, y'all, take care. Take Thanks, care. Everyone. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>